and we're live hello everyone from beautiful Whangarei New Zealand uh, once again with your little uh, made here malfunction well as the heading goes uh, my interaction with um, with New Zealand police over the last 35 years or so when I was a little kid um, my my mum got um, married to a gentleman from New Zealand. She chose this gentleman over another gentleman who was quite rich. And um, the reason for that was because this gentleman had kids. Um, he was a divorcee and had kids. And my mum decided, well, who better to, um, you know, understand um, and look after her child than someone who has children over someone who doesn't. Now, when I... Um, when I was a kid, before I came to New Zealand, my mum came over. It's been about 40 years we celebrated this um, past Queen's birthday Monday. And we had a great time with our family. And, um, of course, in our family lately, we've always been talking about politics and what's going on and stuff. But um, when mum came over about a year before I came over to, you know, settle down and stuff. And so before I came over and, you know, before my, you know, I was supposed to hop on a plane to come over to New Zealand, at Christmas time, I think it was 80, 1980 Christmas. So it would have been gone into like 81. So I've been here for a few years. Um, but when I when I was in Fiji, one of my our neighbors told me that the way I could um I would be accepted in into New Zealand society was if I painted myself silver. That's kind of a weird thing to say to a child who um, doesn't understand what New then even hadn't even heard of New Zealand until you know very recently for the past year or so I say I was only about seven or eight I'd say about seven yeah about, at this point I was about eight so about thirty nine years ago being through forty seven now so what happened you know when you get told that in your head you're like well why do you have to actually paint yourself a different color if you're just going to another country and you think that the whole world was like like you know like fiji was because i'm a, I'm a fiji born indian and our people have been there for, for well over a century now uh we went over um our forebears went over there as laborers what would be known as indentured indentured workers which meant that you signed a contract at that time was for five years you get paid on a weekly basis whoops excuse me let me just get rid of that and you'd be told that you know um you'd come over and you'd work for five years then you could return most of them didn't know what where fiji was they didn't know it was on the other side of the world and so on but i'm one of those you know i'm one of the recipients of their sacrifices um and if, of course if they hadn't taken that um you know made that choice to go over to another country they had no idea what you know what was available there or what how they would live this is like in 19 sorry 1885 after slavery ended in america and around the world of course um the reason they left um was because of the caste system that is still active in india by the way guys if you don't understand what a caste system is is that you're once you're born into a caste whether you are a, um, you know, whether you are a, a uh, very rich, you've been born into a very rich family or something, or if you've been born into a very poor family or something, you know, or if you, um, you know, whatever structure, there's a various amounts of like, I think there's about seven different levels of caste. You never can escape that. You, you're born into it. That's it. Now, Imagine living under that, knowing that if you're born in poverty, that's your entire life. And that you can never, your children will never be able to escape it unless they get some sort of education or that somehow they are able to run away to another country or sign, up, sign away their life to indentureship. A lot of them um, knew, um, you know, a majority of them didn't know what, the hell was going on they just wanted to get out of that system and work uh you got from people from doctors to lawyers to people who just were laborers or who were very poor and didn't even know how to read sign away their life for five years so the idea was that okay let's escape this horrible system that 
for Indians you were born into and you could never escape. And of course, this is still going on. And so a lot of them escaped to Fiji. Um, some of them died on the way. Some of them died on arrival because of diseases on the, on the ships. Uh, the Leonidas was one of the first ones that arrived in Suva Bay at that time, uh, eight, nine, 1885. And, um, and I've got a, a, a graphic novel I'm working on called um, The Grimit, or Grimit. I've been working on it for quite a few years. It's going to take a while to get through it. It's about three volumes, and I've only done the first volume. But it, it talks about how the sacrifices were made and how the choice decisions they made and how they survived 100, you know, that period, which was about 35 years of indentureship. Some of them had horrible, horrible situations they had to get through. Uh, they were maltreated. And, um, you know, a lot of them actually ended up committing suicide because of treatments, or a lot of them were abused. And some of them survived, and some of them carried on. And I'm one of the recipients of the greatness of the sacrifices of my forebears in Fiji. So as I mentioned, you know, I had no idea what New Zealand was like. I had, um, you know, you're not, when you're a child, you have no idea about the places until you see them in magazines and so on. And if you see them in movies and our, ex our experience about the world, and when you're a little kid in Fiji is all about the Bollywood culture and, you know, the whole idea of uh, dance music and all that. And our culture was surrounded around Hollywood, Bollywood. And you'd have um, all, all us kids dancing to the Bollywood music and, you know, learning their dances and stuff. And there's pictures of me as a child doing that. And I, you know, with my cousins and stuff. But coming to New Zealand at eight years old, you know, I was a very troubled kid. And I, uh, you know, um, being, you know, raised a solid mom, um, my grandparents raised me, my uncle, uh, my aunts raised me. And I was the firstborn a grandchild, which w with that comes a lot of privilege, which a lot of bonuses uh, as, a, as a firstborn son kind of thing out of all your, you know, out of all your, um, out of all your um, aunts and aunts and uncles and so forth. I was, a, you know, I was the oldest um, uh, grandchild, especially as a male child. It's kind of, you know, you get spoiled a lot. So when I came to New Zealand, I mean, I didn't understand the culture. I didn't understand what was going on. I thought I was just me and I could do whatever I want. One of the things about um, being thrown into a society you have no idea about is that you have to learn the language. And when I was in Fiji, English was taught, but English wasn't necessary to talk to all your friends and cousins and so on because you talked Hindi. I don't even know how to talk Hindi properly now. After all these years, I haven't known how to talk proper Hindi for a long time. Uh, of course, people expect that of me when they meet me. They think that I'm all about Indian culture and stuff, and I have no idea because it's not, not a part of me and hasn't been a part of me for so long, for decades. Um, parts, members of my family are more Indian than I would ever be, even though I'm the eldest in that family, or in my family, or in my extended family. So when I was a kid, um, I was a very naughty boy. Um, because of who I was and, and the experiences I had growing up and the trauma I had going, going up, I got into a lot of trouble. Um, I was a bit of a thief, uh, you know, a bit of a naughty boy, as they say. And, um, and that carried on until I was like quite, um, you know, into my teens, early teens. I remember one day my dad saying to me, um, you know, you're, what you do reflects on your whole culture, on your whole people, on everybody around you. I don't really understand that for, for a long time, for years, actually. And um, that how people will see you different, uh, especially if you're from a different culture and from a different society. And they take you at face value. They don't take you at what's going on in your head or what you you know, what you think and what you feel. They just see you as you, you know. And I think that has a lot to do with where we are in, in this in the society in the world that we live in that people just take you at face value and they don't look past that skin color or the way you dress and so on they just think that you're just part of that culture and therefore that you should know how to speak that language that you should know how to eat that food or how to cook that food or how to dress that way you should know about the rituals of the culture which i have very 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 slight understanding of because my identity isn't of my culture supposedly right it isn't part of uh, what I look like or who my family is or my extended family is because 
when you when you when you've been molded, suppose you know, into a society, you take that on board. You take on the the greatness and the goodness and of that culture. Because if you don't, then you are you you are not going to go forward in life. You're not going to really move for ahead. If you if you hold on to the past, you'll never ever succeed. You'll never ever go anywhere in life you will just hold on to the past too much i've done that quite a, for a long time holding on to the past and going you know everybody you know uh, that person's done me wrong and i'll hold on to that and um and i'll hold on to things i've done wrong and i've guilt and stuff like that and of course we're talking about police this today and we've been you know talking about police all all week for the last week or so because and with you know a lot of people are take on board other people's um conflicts and one of the things is that when you take on other people's conflicts, you, you have to really understand what that conflict is about. You can't just start spouting on one thing and that thing without understanding the whole thing. When I was a kid, um, because um, of the music I listened to, I get into everything about the culture. It's, it's been my part of my thing about, um, you know, growing up is that I would research everything. Um, you look at the Native Americans. I love their artwork, North North American Indian artwork. I love that artwork, and I would just spend buying books and learning how to do art. And, and you know, a lot of my artwork um, reflects all the different cultures that I um, that I uh, I've enjoyed. Um, they look very tribal. They look very um, unique. But they also uh, come from like. Irish and Scottish artwork that come from the Pacific Island. I've studied art for about over two years from a diploma and stuff, and I've studied filmmaking and all that. And But also, I've spent a lot of time reading. Reading has been one of my... Um, one of my greatest things, because when I was a child, I didn't know how to read English very well. I still have problems with grammar. I don't even know where to put, uh, you know, um, the right apostrophes and so on. And but I can tell you when something is spelled wrong, or if the, if the sentence is not written well, and um, or if it doesn't make sense, and uh, you know if it's lost in translation, as they say. And when I was because I was a, someone who had come into New Zealand at about eight years old, I um, I basically didn't know how to read English and speak English really well, so I had classes, right. I grew up in Morawa, as some of you know, a very small little town up in um, Bay of Islands, known by the by the neighboring town, Kawakao, where the Handabaza toilets are, which nobody, you know, that whole artwork Fung Ray didn't even want, but now is making a huge museum two decades later. All right. And so basically appropriating another landmark. So when we talk about cultural appropriations, and the, I have, a, uh, I really think pe a lot of people don't understand cultural appropriation that much when they spout that. It's really a, a tokenistic thing they do when they start spouting on about cultural appropriation. We, we, the world appropriates every culture. You look at me; I wear a hat that's American. We didn't. New Zealand did not create this hat, right? So we have appropriated, and we put on our own labels on that hat. We, we appropriate graphic novels and we write out like as a comic book creator and writer and artist, I appropriate that culture from America. And people go on about appropriation because they think it's a nice little word because it's got to do with racism when you do that. Actually, it's appreciating and enjoying something and saying, hey, I love that. It's like it's like um, people from Japan and, and South Korea doing hip hop. And then people are saying, well, you shouldn't do hip hop because it's a black thing. Wait, they enjoy that music. They love that music. They, it's, 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 a, it's a music about, um, you know, writing poetry and lyrics and, and putting it out there and enjoying that. And, and, and that whole idea of appropriation is, you look at Pacific Islands, we appropriate every culture because we're a little small area and we don't have, a, even though we have an amazing culture of our own, we still enjoy other cultures. We took a while to make our own films in Fiji, right? Because we didn't create the actual, like, you look at this computer, we did not create it. We enjoy it. So if you're talking about cultural appropriation, we're appropriating a computer that we did not even create. That's why I have a problem when people talk about cultural appropriation. Now, as I said, with art, I, I, 
as an artist, I just um, take on board whatever I find beautiful. And I find a lot of things beautiful and creative. And, um, and, I, and I always get annoyed when people talk about how, you know, uh, well, you shouldn't do this sort of art or you shouldn't do that art because it's not, it's not part of your culture. Because, wait, who says that? Well, it's the people on that are very small-minded when they say that because they don't under understand that people that you, who do that stuff, they actually appreciate that stuff, right? So let's get let's get on to about, um, you know, not get sidetracked. Let me get, get on about my experience with being a naughty boy and my interaction with the police. Um, like, so let me get back to what my dad said. I was about 13 years old, and he said to me, um, once again, he said, you're, whatever you do reflects on your culture because you're the only one of your type here in this area, in this, um, you know, area of bear violence. Uh, at the time, I was the only boy as such. There was females there, there was other ones, but I was, the, I was from Pacific Islands. Others were from other countries who were similar um, tone of darkness as me. And, and so they would, um, you know, I was the one who was getting into trouble all the time, stealing and, you know, getting um, police getting caught and stuff. So one time I actually got in very bad trouble. Um, uh, we had been, a, a married friend and I, uh, who was in my class, who was my neighbor, a good friend of mine. We got caught, um, I mean, basically how the story works is this, we were out at, at Bay of Islands and Pie here for the whole weekend and uh, enjoying ourselves. And my friend comes up to me that these two guys had, um, who were, Pre, you know, um, older than us, pre years older than us from out of college, he came up to and said, "Hey, you know, told him that go and steal that camera that's there that the tourists have had." And I don't know, I'm just on a bike, and me, I just like doing silly things. I'm a naughty boy. I just like showing off. At this point, I'm about fourteen, I'd say, and so, you know, fourteen year old in in Bahia here for the whole weekend, uh, you know. Um, staying you know staying at someone's place and mucking around the day so i got on my bike and i stole these cameras chucked it in my bag and we took off not knowing that someone had called the police on us and as we're as we're um you know as we're um hike uh, hitchhiking back we see pop cops pull up and this is at the opal hill cops pull up uh, we see them go past and we see and we go holy Hold, uh, what we're going to do? So I grab my bag and I chuck uh, the the camera pieces, you know, whatever else that these tourists had taken all these photos into the ravine because I don't think about consequences. All I'm thinking of is about showing off. Next thing I know, these cops come back around and pull us up and go, "Hey, where have you been?" And we just heard about these two brown little boys who had basically stolen something from these tourists from a store. It was a takeaway store in the part here more. And we go, well, we don't know nothing about it. And anyway, we get pulled up and they get take us to the Kawa Co-op station. And me being being the guy who always basically, because of who I am, took the rap. I said, hey, it was all me, it was all me and all me. So my mate's parents came and took him away. Fine. I'm the guy who's sitting there at 14 years old, probably 13 going on boarding, getting basically abused by the police. The police basically decide to play the, we're gonna set them right. Just, you know, that whole scare them, scare them straight thing uh, they were taking on board in the eighties. That doesn't work. I just wanna let you know. What that does is makes you angry. That makes you feel little, that makes you feel belittled. When someone in authority decides to use their power to make you feel small. So I felt very small. I felt very, very powerless. But one of the things, this was my first, very first proper interaction with police. Um, and so what happened was I was basically harassed and bullied by one of the police. Uh, there were two police. One was a brown guy, it's about Maori. The other guy's a white guy. So the white guy takes on board that um, and I don't mean, and I'm not trying to poke that out as that, but I'm going to tell you this how this happened. So he basically pulls out a um, what looks like a hedge clipper, you know, those big scissors things. So he pulls out this. Um, let me just put this up here. See, there we go. 
first. Right. And direction. Please be spelled right. Almost. Okay. There we go. So this is my. Fl so I'm sitting there. My friend's gone all alone with two people in authority in uniform over me. They have all the power. I'm a 13 year old boy without any, any other adult present there to protect me from whatever. I don't understand what the legal thing here is. I don't understand my rights. I don't understand being bullied by someone in authority. And that was the first time that I felt powerless in New Zealand. Um, I felt powerless in Fiji, um, but that's another story. But that was the first time as a teen, as an early teenager feeling powerless in New Zealand. Um, of course, I'm a naughty boy, so I understand being naughty. I understand being told off, and I understand being a thief. But this is a very different, unique situation because when you have people in authority and you don't understand the law and you don't understand your rights because you don't know your rights, right? You feel really, really helpless and powerless, and that, and that's what I felt. I felt like being a, I was being bullied and abused by two adult males, who were there to just set me straight, right? And so they, he, like I said, he pulls out these big hedge clippers that are basically um, uh, garden tools, with um, if I remember right, or actually it might have been. Um, bulk cutters let's just say so he goes on and starts to he realizes that I, that I am Indian right so he decides well you know what we're going to teach him about what happens in India to thieves so he threatens me right that he has the power to cut off my uh, my hands for being a thief and he goes imagine your life without having a hand that's what your people do in your country not realizing I'm from Fiji. I have no idea what my people do in my country, supposedly, right? And so I don't even understand what he's on about. And so he's basically threatening me with a weapon as a 13-year-old boy. And I, and I, for the first time in my life, felt to, you know, utterly helpless with adults. I think because of what happened previously, I, wasn't, I had forgotten what had happened previously. So this was my first place where I felt helpless. Now, you probably wondering, well, you know, he probably didn't have to, you know, you were in the wrong. Of course, I was in the wrong. I was, a, you know, I had stolen something. I had actually taken somebody else's property. I understood that. Everybody understands. If you don't understand being, a, you know, stealing is wrong, right? Everybody understands that. So, but this was like I'm talking about, like, this is my first interaction with police and authority in that level. Uh, all my other interactions with New Zealand um, adults have been very fine up to this point. Uh, but I've never run into authority in this way. So I vowed to myself because I felt abused. I was crying. I was shattered. My whole, you know, understanding of authority had been shattered. That people in authority could have power. And my one thing was always to never trust people in authority ever since. And I've always held abuse. Like, you know, as much as I want to trust people in authority, I will always think twice about where and how and why are they doing what they're doing what's behind the motives you know what what are they thinking about when they say something and um and so there was that so i went home that my mom and dad picked me up and i you know i was just shattered i was boiling my eyes out and so on and you know um i don't remember if i cried in the police station but i was just totally dis distraught i did cry in the car on the way home thinking that was a um, valiant or something anyway so that was my first interaction now for years i um you know it didn't really you know it really um i've had many interactions with police and have, most of them have been great um you know um and i think um our police are the best that we have in new zealand um you know every time i see them i say hello how's things you know they're doing they're just like us normal people doing what they do but one of the one of the reasons i'm very against the new bill they were trying to pass or hopefully they haven't passed or they've been questioning about it is that giving them more authority now whenever you give people more authority they will always go beyond that um they will always um take the next step because they always everybody wants to push the envelope like i said even as a naughty boy i'm always you know was trying to push the envelope until 
that situation. Um, I remember another period um, where we ran into the cops when I was in my 20s, uh, mid-20s. We had taken a car down from here to go to a concert in, um, uh, in uh, what is now called Hobbiton, uh, the parachute co uh, concert. And, and we were just going to get some food. Um, uh, there was about five of us in the car, if I remember right. Uh, three in the back and two of us in the adult, um, you know, we're in our 20s, so we're adults, right? In the front, um, my, um, my um, Tormen friend, who's very light-skinned, half the toner that I am, uh, and we're just driving my other uh, friend's car we're taking borrowed for the time. Now, we, were got, we got pulled over by three cops and even a, petty, a dog wagon, right? And we're wondering why. And so we, we, everybody else except our female driver was ushered into, you know, out of the car and please go and sit down over there where the pizza thing is. And, you know, because that's where we stop. We stop to get a pizza. So these three cops pulled us, um, cars pulled us over with the dog. And the dog was basically there uh, on the passenger side, if I remember well, on my friend, just to make sure she didn't run away. And the whole thing was like, well, we, they had a suspicion that we'd stolen the car and we're driving around. Now, my idea, my thought was, well, couldn't you just bring my friend up or run the number plate and you'd know that wasn't stolen? But no, these guys decided that they would pull over these kids, supposedly, because there's two adults, mind you, we're in our 20s and we got pulled over in Tauranga. And here's about talking about abuse of power. Whatever goes on in the mind of a police, they're thinking negative no matter what. Uh, they're caught, that's why they got the, the dog wagon, right? Um, because they want to see, they want to make sure that nobody's running away. You know, this is in the 90s. Uh, sorry, in 2000, 20 years ago almost, right? And so the question is, why would you call three um, cars on a bunch of kids and a dog wagon, if you, all you could do was just run, run a number plate and just leave us alone. We're, you know, we're just dropped, we're going to get some pizza. You could have just come up and said, how are you going? How's nice? You know, one car is enough. You don't need three. Three. And this is in Tauranga. And my friend, my female friend, after was so distraught at watching a dog bark at her and watching these officers there harass her um, because she had done nothing wrong, yet they knew they had the authority over all of us, but especially her at that time, because she was a driver. And and later that night, she was distraught, just like I was at 14. Ten years later, she was distraught. And I watched this. So this is a female and there's a male, myself, what, you know, watching this and thinking, why could they have not run a number plate instead of destroying our trust in our police? And this is what it's really about when you talk about police and stuff and behavior and stuff. And we, I mean, there are a service, there are community servers of civil servants who, um, you know, who are there to protect and serve, right, to our community. Whenever we give them a license to uh, do more than that, then the behavior of the community becomes very, um, self-conscious and uh, have a negative view of police. And a lot of times in our, as, as, in, as teenagers, as we're growing up, and even children, our, our, uh, our interaction with police is normally not one of good. Um, normally, and over 50%, probably around 70% is negative. Now, to do that, we say we'll have community policing. Now, recently, they've taken community policing away, and they've turned it into where they have, uh, they will sit, you know, most of them will sit in their offices watching cameras, not on, not being on the street and being, hello, how are you going, everything, all right, yeah, being part of the community. But now they hold up in their own offices watching behavior and when, you know, how people interact from behind a camera, like I'm doing right now. Right, and watching how people uh, on the street interact, and so their response, because they're not on the street, their response is late, or their response is, uh, you know, after the fact. Um, 
and a lot of times it's always you know comes across biased towards one side or the other side and you know when um, one of the things about um being part of a community there was a time um you know talking about good good policing when i was in auckland when i was in my um late um late teens uh, i left home when i was about 17 and uh, i've been out of home since i was 17 so that's a long time probably about 30 years of my life has been spent living everywhere else with every other different culture that i can think of and you know even my first girlfriend was taiwanese uh you know so i've lived in very different um communities um cultures growing up um so when i so one time there was a uh, a very bad situation happened in Auckland, uh, which really made me think about uh, me as a person reflecting my culture, which I hadn't thought about for a long time. As I mentioned earlier, what, what my dad said to me that I, uh, whatever my behaviour was, my um, you know rebellious interactions in society was that um, it reflected on my culture. I don't understand that. So one 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 time, my uh, my uncle rang me up. I was at work. He said, "Hey, look." Uh, there has been a situation and we need you to please come and be in a lineup if you understand what a police lineup is you get lined up and um, with other people of your own you know in this situation that looks similar to you uh, especially because this had to do with an indian person who had done a crime a horrific crime and i understand, now after that i really understood about reflecting on your culture and uh, being a voice and being a reflection of your culture even though I'm not part of that culture, but my skin color made me that, or my ethnicity made me that. So we got called up, and there was about, I think there was about four others. And one of the officers was actually Indian in his 40s. And he said to us, hey, look, we caught this guy and this other guy who had done this horrific. And we we were all, mind you, there's all, all of this Indian men here, right? I think there's about six or seven of us, if I remember right, if you include my uncle. And we were, we heard what had happened, right? We heard what had happened and we wanted to beat this guy up ourselves. We wanted to take this guy aside and just bash the crap out of him. Because what he had done was not only horrific, but he had done as, you know, he had done it as being an Indian and uh, reflected on a culture. And, um, you know, he, he over a weekend, he had done something very horrible to some a female, um, and it was really horrible. It could not get any more horrible than you know than it was, apart from killing her, right? So we were there, and we were talking amongst ourselves, thinking, "Excuse me, shoulder stuff." Uh, we were there, and we we're talking about our culture and as an adult mind you i was probably about yeah i was probably about 19 or 20 at this point i've been working i was working full time and stuff and um and all of us were just talking about what he had done and we're talking about our culture and how it reflected on our culture and our community especially on our community remember this is this is 1990 um, so this is about 30 years ago right almost 30 years ago and we you know the indian community was not that big that time and this reflected on all of us indian males especially indian males because this was a this was a guy who did a horrific thing with another person of another culture onto another person of another culture right so those three different cultures from my right this was involving in but these two males had basically desire one of them being indian to do these horrific things to this female over an entire weekend and the, and the police had caught him they caught him both she had identified him but because we wanted justice to be because the police wanted to be justice to be served correctly in the courts they'd made us do a lineup and put him with us and we were just going why can't we just have a go at him? Why can't we just just give us a bat or something and we'll deal with them ourselves? Us, us six, seven of us Indian males will deal with this Indian male who had done this horrific crime ourselves. But no, justice has to be served because it reflected on our culture and so on. And that's when I realized of how important it is not 
to be a criminal and, uh, you know, and a rebellious person, uh, you know, or commit crimes. And um, because it reflects on your culture. And that was a that was a good interaction with the police because I learned that the police had a law and had a system, had had justice to fulfill. There was laws, there was courts, there was um, you know, there were steps to follow. And that was a good interaction because we got to learn from an Indian police officer who was serving his community, who had caught along with his fellow detectives, the persons in, who had done this horrific crime. But we amongst ourselves were talking about how this reflected on us. As you know now, the uh, Indian community in Auckland is growing and stuff, and there's a lot of activists, right, who don't understand this sort of stuff, that there are criminals in our cult, um, in our communities who get away with crimes, and we uh, sometimes as activists uh, prop them up and protect them. And, and, and we don't like to discuss things in our co communities because it reflects on us badly. And But this was this is in 1990, and it totally reflected back on our, badly on our community. Um, seeing somebody who was Indian male do such horrific crimes that we, that we, you know, we were shattered by as Indian males who had to stand up in the lineup. And this, we watched this woman point this guy out and saw the horror in her eyes and the anger for what they'd done to her. That whole weekend, for a whole weekend, they'd done this to her. But we were there going, we're sorry. Us male, other males, they're going, we're so sorry that someone in our community had done this to you. And this is something I think we, a lot of us forget. That if when we, each one of us represent our community uh, and we forget that um, how it reflects on every other one, person around us who are similar to us, of skin color, ethnicity, whatever. Uh, and we forget that we reflect our village. As they say that, um, you know, it takes a village to raise a person. And we stop thinking about responsibility and we th stop thinking about how, um, you know, um, how people see us when we do crimes, when we do, um, you know, when we behave badly, um, you know, and we don't think about how it reflects on our elders, on our young, and we don't think about how we, what we do reflects on our future generations. How, what our behavior, our, our, our um, responses to what happens to us. And a lot of us, because we have bad behavior, like I said, I was traumatized at 13 by police. And so um, it, didn't, it took me probably about five years before I actually respected police again for their, for their position in our, in, our, in our society. You know, they're just like us, but they have to wear, they wear a badge and they have authority over us given by us. This is something that people don't understand that we give authority to the police. We allow, our, we give, give authority to our government to choose whoever's the commissioner but they still serve us as and until they stop serving us they you know we have power over them and even when they stop serving us we still have power over them to say hey if you have done wrong as an officer we'll take you to court or you'll be charged you should pay for your crimes and we can't let police get away with this you know crime and we know that we have the best police service in new zealand yet our system still fails sometimes but we still have, uh, you know, outside commissions that um, have, um, they're able to get in there and think. One of the things that people don't realize is that there's no such thing as white privilege or black privilege. And every time I hear that, I cringe because I know that people don't really understand money. They don't understand it's money is what gives us privilege. And you, as I mentioned about the caste system in India earlier, that those people are born into it they have no money, or that they do, it's very little, and they can never get out of the system. And it's the same here in New Zealand. You can, you know, uh, if you spend your entire life living on the dole uh, and generations and generations of your family, you only are used to that couple of hundred dollars, and you're happy within that. And so you are in a caste system. Believe it or not, you're in a caste system of poverty in New Zealand. That social welfare is a caste system. As long as you rely upon that, 
And I've had to rely on that many times because I've um, been unemployed, I've been a student and so on. Uh, and right now I'm totally ill because of the um, injuries I've suffered over the years and due to car accident and having to rely on it. But it is a, it is a system, the social welfare is a system like a cast, and I and this is what I talked about um, the other week about how the next uh, level, and even my, one of my friends mentioned that this is a new level of caste system for those that have been unemployed because of the CV uh, virus, right? That we we're getting to a point where we basically put people in um, situations of income. And that's why, um, you know, my, uh, my friend Jay, uh, Captain Jay, always, uh, Reverend Jay, as he likes to be called, talked about how we need a um, a living wage, a wage that allows people to be an equal, equal uh, amount of pay. But that also comes with responsibility, uh, personal responsibility. If you, as a person, continue to only will and survive on that, small amount of money every week and that's all you're happy with that's fine but remember you will never go ahead in life you will never um, educate yourself unless you're willing to get to the library or get online to learn why are you even doing this um, you know because you want to get out of this caste system that we call social welfare i call it a caste system um, because it is a it is a level of poverty as long as you stay in that you will you will not, won't be able to help your children. You won't be able to help um, them get out of that because they'll look at you and go, well, mom and dad's happy with that. Then might as well, it'll be fine for me when I grow up. I'll go, go and be on that system as well. But if you're on that system, be like me, right? Educate yourself and be like many others, man, who, um, who's out, who have out there used that to educate themselves and get into this thing. You know, there's a new thing that they've got about being, um, my friend the other day, Ray mentioned about being a youth worker. You know, uh, there's zero fees to be a youth worker now. You know, you don't have to pay for your fees. Do that. Do something to get off the dole. Um, show your children, um, you know, show your brothers and sisters that not to rely upon a small amount, reach for the higher goal of actually trying some more. So that you, you don't get into a system where, um, you know, have interactions with the police, where it comes where you're doing crime and stuff and you're getting going in circle and circle you know forever being angry at other people because you've been you know harassed by the police for whatever you've done and sometimes police harass you for no reason and we understand that like i said before being our friend being pulled over for no reason and being harassed to the point where she later on broke down at home because she was so distraught over that the interaction as i mentioned earlier so if you if you if you want to better your life, there's no reason not to better your life in this culture that we live in. The internet and digital age offer so much. You can just basically, you know, for free learn new new skills while you're on the dole. Why you you know as long as you have internet, you can do that on your phone. There's no reason not to learn something new. Uh, no reason to research what you love. Research your fucker papa, right? So you can learn that. You know, we've got we've got a lo local uh, school here. Uh, that offers zero fees to learn your language, you know, to learn another language. There's no reason not to learn Spanish or whatever, you know, Mandarin, Chinese. There's no, you know, when you're sitting at home, there's no reason to learn something new. And I think if you, the only thing we can do to get out of our system, our, our, um, our place in society that we're blocked into uh, due to our low income or whatever, it's our lack of willingness to be to educate ourselves and take responsibility for ourselves, and uh, I think there's something that's lacking in us as in our culture right now is responsibility and um, taking control over our own thinking and our over our own uh, positions and um, and reflecting on our own th thoughts and how we. Can get ahead there's no reason when you're seven days a week doing nothing and um to not do something to improve yourselves um i think you know there's so much free out there to learn and uh even the government offering so much more now um and i think the challenges we face are so small in our current society despite all the horrible things that are happening around us um we can there, 
you know, there's so much benefit we can get from, you know, what we have at in our fingertips right now. I mean, imagine for, when I was a kid at seven or eight coming to New Zealand, I never ever knew that there'll be, you know, in the future there'll be a computer that I'll be able to speak to someone like this around the world, let alone locally. Yet we have this access right now that not, I think probably 90% of our homes have fiber, fiber lines. And we all, all of us basically have a couple hundred dollars worth of uh, phones in our hands. And isn't that amazing? You know, um, and I think we don't understand the privilege we actually have just to have a phone in our hands. That we don't understand that we have the internet and this little, little tiny, little rectangular thing, right? That we can talk to anybody in the world, talk to anybody in New Zealand, um, get on there and ring them or just chat to them, you know, message them and stuff, share images, share, you know, what we love, music. But we don't take time out to understand that we can use this little thing to educate ourselves and get off what we're, positions we're in society um, and better ourselves. You know, um, one of the, uh, like I said, I've had very good interactions with police as well, and I've had very bad. Um, I think the, the, if we teach each other um, and ourselves to take responsibility for our actions, we'll have good, a good community and we'll have a good society that we don't have to worry about racism or we don't have to worry about privilege. We don't have to worry about what somebody else is doing because we're too, too busy doing what we're doing, uh, too excited about what we're doing and we're sharing what we're doing and um, happy about what we're creating. And that's one of the things, I mean, uh, like uh, at the end of the day, you know, um, I think our, our um, we lack appreciation, a lot of us, especially, you know, my, my mind is always like a 20 year old's mind in this brain. I think I missed out on a lot when growing up, and I think my brain just decided, well, we'll stay at 20, <laughs> right? You can, you, you know, my body's breaking and stuff. My hair's going gray, gone bald already. I went bald at 27, so I don't really worry about getting bald. But we, uh, you know, we, uh, we always think about what everybody else is doing and um, how much everybody else has and how privileged somebody else is. And we don't think about, how privileged we are ourselves to live in an amazing country like New Zealand. Um, you know, do you have so much freedoms? And, um, you know, when I started doing the broadcast, um, you know, I think about two months ago, or whenever CV started and we went to lockdown, you know, my whole thing was to, as, as negative as it was to be in, in that situation, my, my thing was to just try to show people that, you know, take control of your life at this time, you know, we're during lockdown and even now, take control of yourself, take control of your thoughts, learn, um, learn how to, how your brain works. One of the thing, best things you can do is learn how to rethink and restructure your thinking. Um, you know, a lot of people go into religion um, to do that, and that's fine. Um, but if you are not into religion, the best way to do that is watch some TED Talks on that. You know, uh, your neuro, neuroscience is amazing. Um, you know, I, like I said, I spent 2018 basically learning how to how my brain works, how to get away from negative thoughts, how to stop blaming other people, how to uh, control my own ideas, and how to be a better creative person, how to be a better person as a whole. Um, and I think the idea is to, um, to not be worried too much about what somebody else is thinking, but restructuring your own thought patterns and thinking about how you can actually better yourself and i think it's, it's a cliche you know and people because it's cliche people discount that i think um because it's cliche people discounting that takes away from the importance of that you know um one of the things um you know there's a book by jordan peterson um 12 um 12 rules for getting out of chaos something like that i, I recommend it because it's just very simple rules you know one of them is get your house in order you know tidy up your room um, you know, I think a lot of times we forget the little things and, um, it doesn't take much to be, to be a better, be a better person, but I learned how to be a better person by watching, um, TED Talks. 
and about my neurosciences, as I mentioned, like how my brain works. One of the things you've got to really think about, excuse me, is to figure out how and why you think the way you think. Um, that, you know, it's important that um, you reflect, take time out in the day, for half an hour, whatever, to just sit down and just think about why you behave the way you behave, why you think the way you think, and how do you how you interact with other people. Because everything comes out of your thinking, out of your head, not your emotions. Because you, if once you once you get your thinking in order, your emotions will come into order. You know that anger, that um, violent, uh, that um, that hurt. You'll be able to work it out. And hey, of course, there's lots of lots of services to help you. Free services in the community, even here locally, right? That can help you. Um, you know. Once, if you're struggling with something, you can get um, help from. And I think um, it's important uh, not to try to struggle with things on your own if it gets too much. And always look for help. And I think you're not a weak person, you're not a weak male, you're not a weak female, uh, because we all are different. Um, our backgrounds are different, but we all can do with a little bit of help at, at the end of the day. And it's important to recognize that we need help when we do. And of course, there's so many services. There's a lot of money being put into mental health in New Zealand. But um, a lot of services are not being utilized because people are afraid that they'll feel, you know, that then they're useless or they feel that they, because they need help, that they'll be looked down to. But I don't, th that is not the attitude to do. I think the best thing to do now is to, you know, take time out, half hour a day, and just think about where you're in life and how you fit into our, into society, into New Zealand, into your culture. What is your identity? It's important to figure out who you are. And if you don't spend time figuring out who you are, you're easily manipulated by everybody around you, your friends, your family, you know, uh, politics, whatever's happening on social media. If you take half an hour of your time every day to just sit down and go, you know, have a smoke, have a beer, have a pizza or whatever, just whatever you got to do. You know, to come, you know, to take some time out. If you do that, that half an hour a day, you'll find that you'll learn to figure out who you are and what you want. And you'll figure out that there's so much available in our society at our fingertips to better ourselves. And I think the idea is that um, all the interactions you can have in life, they can be either negative or positive, but only you can decide if it's going to be good for you if it's going to be important to you. Nobody can tell you what, how to live your life, as they say, and nobody should. But you should be able to figure out what you want for yourself at the end of the day. And you should be able to take control of yourself. And the way to do that is take time out and figure out who you are. Um, for all the negative things I've had happen in my life, and they've been horrible ones, there have been a lot of positive things because I've surrounded myself with positive people. And that's what will happen. You also around yourself with people that are like you. And if you if you take time out to figure out what's best for you and what you think is best for you, you'll find out that you'll find people that are, you know, have interactions with you that are positive for you as well. At the end of the day, nobody can change you. Only you can. Because when people try to change you and you change for them, it won't feel like it's something important to you. It's only when you figure out what you what's important to you and that you are doing it for yourself. That's when you when you will realize you deserve it. But when people tell you how to change, it won't matter because after a little while, you just go back to your own routine. But when you decide what you want for yourself, that's when you figure out, I'm doing it for me, only me. And that's what matters at the end of the day is what you want to do with your life and how you want to live. And um, it's important. And, you know, I think um, it's important to reflect on what you want in life. I've spent many years of my life not knowing what I want out of life, and I want it back and forth through different things. But I've learned a lot of things in that time as well. I studied a lot, and I spent a lot of time in um, tertiary education and, um, and arts and stuff. And that's helped me to become who I am. And, you know, and it, it's very important to figure out what is important to you and what you want out of life because you don't want to be at 47 years old going or 45 going i wish i'd done this i wish i'd tried that i, I wish i'd gone into that country i wish i'd ta gone, taken that you know oe or i wish i'd 
learn that language and so on. Experience what you want to experience, but experience it for good and for yourself. Don't do it for others. Do it for yourself. Because then it will be important. And what's important to you is going to, you know, reflect who you are. And, um, and you will then have an amazing place in society. And you know what? Without knowing, you will, you will change our society for good when you yourself have changed for good. I think that's all I got to say today. And, um, you know, we talked about police, we talked about all this stuff. Um, but also, look after yourselves. Um, it's important to take care of your own mental health and I think, you know, and your own self. And um, even now, as it's going to get hard um, with unemployment rates and stuff, learn something new. Um, learn something while you're on your phone. Um, you know, treat each other well, treat yourself well. Whenever you do something for yourself, you, you, um, you'll benefit from it, and so will others. So Kakiti, I know from me tonight, here in Whangarei, it's Saturday. If you're watching somewhere in the Northern Hemisphere, it's Friday for you. Hopefully, wherever you are, you're well. Take care of yourself and your families, and I'll see you next time.